All right, today we're reading from John chapter 4. Stand with me. We're going to do something today. I want you to participate in our service. Uh, this won't hurt you at all. They won't call you Pentecostal. If they do, it won't matter anyways, okay? Take your Bible. If you have a Bible, hold it way up high so everybody can see it. Don't be ashamed of the Word of God. If you don't have a copy of the Word of God, there's a Bible in your pew. Hold it up. There's a Bible in your pew. Take it home with you. We want you to have a Bible, okay? Say this with me today. Today I will be taught the Word of God. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. Amen. Don't that sound good? Amen. Let's read this passage of Scripture today. John chapter 4. It's a long passage, verses 5 through 15, but I want to read this and you follow along with me in the Word of God. The Bible says this, speaking of Jesus, then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask, Drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus had answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you today that you have given us this opportunity to meet in your house, to worship you, and to serve you. Lord, it is always good to come to our church that we call our church, our church family and fellowship and worship with one another. But Lord, more important than that, it's good to come here and to know that your presence is with us. And so, God, we welcome your Holy Spirit into our presence today. We pray that you would use this message to speak truth into our life. God, we pray that each and every one that is here would search their heart and would search their life and make things right with you if they need to before they leave today. Lord, we want to pray especially for those that are teaching our children at the other property today. God, I pray that you would help them as they're ministering to, to the little ones this morning and just... Lord, speak words to them that they need to hear as well. Father, I pray that you would forgive me today as I stand here as a sinner. I realize that. But Lord, I'm asking that you would forgive me of the sin that is in my life and place it beneath the blood of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Leave your Bible open to this passage if you would. I've noticed as I've begun uh, watching TV, I don't watch a lot of TV, but um, as I've been watching TV, you know, it's coming close and closer and closer to where we're going to have a presidential election here in just, you know, a couple years. And so all the politicians are out and they're talking and they're, they're starting to make, it, make their run. And I found myself thinking this week of this thought. Would it not be wonderful if every politician that... Uh, came on TV if they told the absolute truth and we knew, knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything coming out of their mouth was truth. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, while you're laughing, let me say this. Would it also be wonderful if we could come to church and know that every single Christian that claimed to be a child of God, that everything that they said, every word out of their mouth, that it would be truth? It's amazing that you, uh, you like that about the politicians, but then when we talk about it about Christians, it's a, it's a different story. Well, let me say to you today that there was a consistent theme with Jesus, and that is that Jesus always spoke truth. Do you believe that? In fact, let me ask you a question. Who better to give you direction and guidance in your life about truth than Jesus, the Son of God? In fact, in John chapter 18, there's a verse there that, that speaks on this just a little bit. In fact, if you know that passage, Jesus had been arrested. And uh, this was just prior to his crucifixion. He's standing there before Pilate. And we are given a passage where Jesus is standing on the platform as the Messiah. And he is speaking and he says these words in John chapter 18... In verse 37, Pilate said unto him, it says, Are you the king? Jesus answered and said unto him, I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. 
And then notice what Jesus said. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Folks, we are living today in a time where we need truth. We need gospel-centered truth. It, it seems as though it's hard to tell today facts from, from fiction. It's hard today sometimes to tell if a person is telling you the truth or if they're telling you a lie. Some would say it's even hard to tell right from wrong. Uh, there are more shades of gray, I think, today than probably ever in history. What is right and, and what is wrong? There's the pressure today to be politically correct. There's a pressure today to say that there's many ways to God. Well, listen, Jesus settled that. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Those are not the words of some professor, of some scholar. Those are the words of Jesus Christ himself. I've shared this story with you before, but I think it's worth sharing again. Um, uh, Dr. Rice was talking to a man one day, and he, this man said to him, he said, Dr. Rice, uh, certainly there couldn't just be one way to heaven. I mean, we're all trying to get there. We're just going different ways. And this gentleman gave an example. He said, just like when you go home, they were at the post office. He said, when you leave today, you're going to go down one highway. I'm going to go down another. But we're all going to get to the same location. And Dr. Rice said to him, that's good and well, but when we're talking about your eternal soul, we're not going to the post office or we're not going home. We're going to heaven or we're going to hell. And that's true. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He said this before Pilate in our text today in verse 37 of John chapter 18. To this end was I born. Now, not only did Jesus say, I've come to tell the truth, but I'm glad that Jesus could say, I am truth. I never have to wonder about what's right and wrong because we are attached to the very source of truth, and that is Jesus Christ himself. Now, there's a classic example of Scripture that, that we have read many times in our life, perhaps, such as our text today, where a woman was confronted with the truth that is found in Scripture. In fact, in this passage this morning, we have a conversation between Jesus and, and this woman. And during this conversation, Jesus tells this woman the truth about herself. He goes on and he tells her the truth about her life. And then he tells her truth about what he can offer her. The story unfolds here in John chapter 4. And I want you to turn back there in John chapter 4, going back to verse 3, because I want to pick up on the story here with this thought in mind. Remember, Jesus is truth. We don't have to wonder what truth is. Jesus is truth. It says in verse 3, he left Judea and departed unto Galilee. And then notice what verse 4 says, and he must needs go through Samaria. That means he had to go through there. Why? Well, let me tell you why that seems interesting to me. Because in that day and time, Jewish people did anything that was possible to avoid Samaritans. This was awkward that Jesus would say, hey, let's, let's go through this area. Jews did not like Samaritans at all. But in the Bible, in this passage, it says that Jesus needed to go through there. He must needs go through Samaria. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever wondered why? Why would Jesus choose to go through Samaria whenever Jews didn't even like the Samaritans? I think Scripture teaches us very plainly that Jesus wanted to go through Samaria because Jesus wanted to meet this woman. He was God in the flesh, and he knew that this woman would be there. And Jesus wanted to offer her eternal life, and that's exactly what happened. Paraphrasing, the story goes like this. Jesus comes to this well. The Bible tells us when you read that passage that it's noon. That's the heat of the day. Jesus is described in our text as being tired. So he sits down. Now imagine this in your mind. He's sitting there and he begins resting. He sends his disciples into town to go get lunch. And so Jesus is left there all alone. And suddenly this Samaritan woman comes out to the well. Now, we need to understand a few things. And by saying that, what I'm talking about is the situation of this woman. She's coming out at noon, the hottest part of the day. And she's coming by herself. 
Listen, here again in that day and time, and especially in that culture, a woman would not do that. For one, it would be dangerous to come alone to the well. She could have been taken. She could have been murdered. She could have been beaten. A lot of things could have gone wrong. You would never go alone as a woman going to the well for security reasons also. But this woman is alone. And it's midday. So what does that tell us about this woman? It tells us that she was a social outcast. She is there and she is all alone. And Jesus, of all people, in the middle of the day, is talking to this social outcast. Now, we could stop right there at that specific thing, and we could preach a series of sermons about how we need to be receptive of other people. And let me say something to you, church. Not everyone that comes in here is going to look like us. Not everyone's going to act like us. Not everyone's going to know that we come in, we sing a song, we have announcements, and we go through this routine. There may be times where when we get involved in the community that people's going to come in and they don't know what church is like. What do we do in those situations? Do we treat them as outcasts? Do we throw them to the side? I want you to notice some truths that are found in this passage. Jesus welcomed this woman. Jesus had an appointment with this woman. Jesus wanted to tell this woman something. And so I want to point out specifically four truths that we find in this text that can be seen in the life of this woman at the well, but also are true in our life as well. Four truths. Number one, truth number one, I cannot hide my past from God. Notice what verse 16 says in John chapter 4. Jesus said unto her, they're starting this conversation now, and he says, Go call thy husband and tell him to come. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said, I have no husband. Thou hast said, Well, for thou hast five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now again, just imagine this conversation taking place. Jesus says to her as he's talking to this woman, Hey, why don't you go get your husband? And she says immediately, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, That's right. You have five. And the man that you're living with now, he's not your husband. What does this woman do? She became real religious, didn't she? She said, Oh, you must be a prophet. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever tried to hide something from God by talking religious? By using your religious language and trying to hide something from others and hide something from God? Why is it that we as Christians sometimes believe that we can smuggle our sins past God? I mean, what makes us think that we can sneak something past the eyes of an all-knowing and an all-seeing God? This goes all the way back to the creation of man. Adam and Eve did this in the Garden of Eden. They were naked and the Bible tells us that they were ashamed. Back that, during that time, they were living in perfect innocence. But they disobeyed God, and what happened? That sin led to shame. Listen to me, church. The truth is, I can't hide my past from God. I can't hide my sin from God. And you know what sin will do? Sin will always bring shame in your life. You can pretend that it's not there, but sin always brings shame into your life. And do you know what shame leads to? Shame leads to secrets. Shame leads to us hiding things in our life. And secrets make us feel like we have to cover up. We have to tell one story to cover up this story, and it's all a result of sin. Now, there are some common things that we do when we sin that all of us do. Number one, we try to ignore our sin. A second thing we do is we try to give in to our sin. This woman here, she could have been truthful. I mean, why didn't she just say, yes, Jesus, you're right. I have five husbands and I'm not living with my husband now. Why did she not say that? Because there's something in our human condition that says, don't open up to anyone. Don't confess anything, even to God. And she would rather lie than tell the truth. Do you know the sad reality is we all have secrets that we don't want anyone else to know about? 
And if you don't think that that's true, how would you feel this morning if Jesus walked in today and one by one he called us up on this stage and right here on the overhead he began to list all of the things in our life that he is not pleased with. There's not one person sitting here today that would say, I'll go first. Call on me, Jesus. You can examine my life. The truth is we try to hide our sins from God. And that's exactly what this woman was doing. She wanted to be religious and say, oh, you must be a prophet and talk about religious things. And in fact, that's really what she goes on to do. If this Bible story teaches us anything, I think it teaches us that God knows all about our past. But he also knows what's going on in our life today. Truth number one, remember this church, I cannot hide my past from God. God knows who we are. God knows all about our sin. We can't cover that up. We can hide it from each other to an extent, but we'll never be able to hide who we really are before a holy God. Now here's the second truth I want you to see in this passage. Secondly, Jesus knows all about me, and he still loves me. Isn't that good news? Even though I'm a sinner, even though I have a past, even though Jesus knows all of that, this woman fit that category. Jesus didn't cast her out. Jesus loved her. Look at verse 23 of our text. It says, But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now notice verse 25. The woman said unto him, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speaketh unto thee am he. Just imagine that scene. She's talking to the Son of God. He is saying to her, she's saying, I know the Messiah is going to come and he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus looks at her and he says, I am the Messiah. Can you imagine how that poor woman must have felt? After he just said, I know you have five husbands. And the man that you're living with is not your husband now. You see, the reason that we try to hide our sin from God is because there's something in the human condition that says to us, if God knows who I really am, God will not love me. And friends, I want to tell you that could not be further from the truth. But it is how we think. It is our, our sinful condition because we think that about others. Why do we try to hide and cover up who we really are? We don't want people to know who we really are because we won't be accepted by them. Remember, God already knows who we are. He knows every sin in our life. Does the Bible teach that the moment God discovers things about us, that he stops loving us and he stops caring about us? No. Jesus knew her. He knew all about her, and in spite of that, he loved her. Now, I would ask you this morning, how does that compare with your concept of God? This is a message that a lost world needs to hear. Jesus knows about your sin. He knows who you are. But listen, he loves you in spite of your sin. He wants to help you. He wants to save you. I've always believed God is more interested in my future than he is in my past. I've always believed that, and I think the Bible teaches that. Hey, friend, when I get to heaven, I, you know, I'm not going to walk up to you and say, Hey, how did you finally make it here? I never expected to see you. I'm going to know it's because of the grace of God that you made it there and that I made it there. I'm not going to be surprised to see anybody. They may be surprised to see me. I'm going to say, Praise God, it's by the grace of God that I'm here. I made it through Christ and Christ alone. That's how we're all going to make it there. Jesus said, I am the only way. There's a third truth. Truth number one, I can't hide my past from God. Truth number two, Jesus knows about me and he still loves me. Truth number three, my sin has consequences. See, folks, it's not enough just to preach a gospel that says Jesus loves you and Jesus can forgive you. Is that true? Yes, that's true. But we must understand that our sin has consequences. Verse 16, I read it to you. Jesus said, call your husband. And then he said, I know you have five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. What's happening? This woman is living in the consequence of her sin. Think of the high price she was paying as a result of her sin. And I want to tell you, sin will always cost you something. Sin will always cost you more 
than you're willing to pay. That is the high price that sin cost us. Spiritually, this woman is dead. Spiritually, she is thirsty. Someone once said that sin is fun on credit. Isn't that true? That's what it is. It's fun while it lasts, but then once it's over, there's a consequence that's attached to that sin. When we sin, we never get to choose how much we pay, do we? It doesn't work that way. When we sin, we don't get to pick the consequences of our sin. In fact, that's exactly what the Bible teaches in Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. That's scripture, folks. That's what the Bible teaches us. My sin has consequences. There's a fourth truth in this text that we can learn from this woman. And that is that Jesus is the only one who can satisfy my deepest need. I want to tell you today, you can search for all kinds of things to deal with the sin in your life. You can drink, and it may, may help you uh, feel better for a while. You can take pills, it may help you feel better for a while. But Jesus can only is the only one that can heal the soul. Jesus is the only one that can quench that deep thirst that we all have. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. I need that living water. Amen, don't you? I want that living water. In verse 14, he says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Does that mean you're not going to sin? No. Does it mean you're not going to have problems? No. But listen, I wouldn't trade my Christianity for nothing, for nothing in this world to know that Jesus is with me, that he can give me the peace and the hope that I need in my life at all times. Amen. All through Scripture, we are described as being thirsty. Think back to the psalmist, Psalm 42. As a deer panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. Are you thirsty for the things of God? Isaiah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. Sound familiar? Jesus said in Revelation 21, 6. And he said unto me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Do you notice that this woman represents people just like you and I? It's easy to look at her and say, yeah, but this was not a good woman. Well, listen, because of sin, we're not good people. She represents us in the fact that she had a void in her life. She represents us that she was searching for something more. Now let me ask you a question, a practical question I want you to think about before we leave this morning. When was the last time that you were able to peacefully put your head on your pillow at night and feel free? No shame, no guilt, I'm free, I am forgiven, I am right with God, I know that God is pleased with my life. I can honestly say the times in my life where I've laid my head on my pillow and I've prayed and I know that I am right with God, it is the most peaceful feeling that a human being can ever experience. Amen. And if you've never experienced that, you cannot experience that apart from God's Son, Jesus Christ, that provides salvation for us. Amen. It's always amazed me that... As I look around and I look at religious people, I look at church people, I think to myself, if the church knew me the way that God knew me, what would they think about me? If I knew you the way that God knows you, what would be my opinion of you? Well, here's the thing. Aren't you glad I'm not God? Aren't you glad I'm not your judge? I'm glad you're not God and you're not my judge. I'm glad I have a holy God that I can go to and say, God, forgive me of my sins. I'm trusting you as my Savior. I want to live for you. And when I humble myself before God, God will forgive me of my sins. Amen. Folks, we can't hide our past from God. God knows all about us, but He still loves us. But in spite of that, our sins are going to have consequences. So as a result, 
Jesus is the only one that can satisfy that deep need that we have. And it only comes through salvation. Now ask yourself a very personal question today. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? And if you do, are you living for Him? If not, do something about that today. Examine your life. If Jesus walked in here, He would do the same thing to this woman. He would find those that were down and out, and He would do everything He could to draw them to Him, to lift them up, to encourage them, and set them on the right path. That's what Jesus did. That was His ministry, to bring them to salvation. My question to you this morning is this. What do you need from Jesus? Whatever it is, you take care of it today. You deal with it today. You nail it down today and leave here knowing that when you lay your head on your pillow tonight that all is well with your soul. Will you do that this morning? Let's stand together. Father, we thank you today that you've given us this time to meet in your presence and in your house. Lord, we thank you for these illustrations in the Bible and these stories that speak truth to our life. God, I'm so grateful that you didn't just come to the wealthy to the educated. Lord, you didn't just come to those that seemed as though they had it all right, the religious. But God, you came to the lowest people on this earth and you were there to provide forgiveness of our sins. Lord, I don't know the needs of everyone that is here today, but I do know this. We are human beings and as a result of that, we are sinners. And there's not a day goes by but what we don't need to say to you, God, forgive me of my sins and evaluate our life and look at our life. And search our heart. And so, God, I pray that today, during this invitation, this would be a time when we would do that as well. Help us to examine our life and search our heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What page are we going to sing, Brother Paul? 191. Page 199, 191. As we sing our invitation hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. If you need to come this morning, this altar is open. As we sing, I invite you to come.